Hi everyone, this is Dr. Han, and welcome back to the biotechnology series. Now today we are going to have a quick summary and non-technical lecture on the polymerase chain reaction or PCR and its variant RT-PCR. Now I'm sure most of us have heard of and perhaps been subjected to a few PCR tests since the spring of 2020. Now here we are not debating the validity of using PCR tests as a diagnostic tool for a certain disease. It is a pure discussion of the science behind it. So let's get started. Here are the lecture objectives. We are going to learn about the principles of PCR and RT-PCR and understand how PCR empathizes and helps identify the genetic markers of an organism. The picture here is an agrose gel image that I generate in my lab to check my PCR product. I have probably set up more than a thousand PCR reactions for research purposes in my lifetime, and it's almost a second nature to me now. Last time we talked about how to verify the presence of a plasmid after performing transformation or transfection on a cell. Mm, but how do you know if you have the right DNA fragment or gene being inserted or ligated to the plasmid? Now one way to do that is to perform restriction enzyme digestion on the plasmid to generate multiple predictable fragments with known sizes and run it on an agarose gel. Now with the knowledge of the sizes of the digested pieces, researchers can observe and identify genes of interest. But sometimes the DNA material is too little to show up on an agarose gel image. To solve that, researchers can use PCR to quickly amplify all the DNA fragments to a quantity that will show up on a gel image. Now this way it fulfills the purpose of testing or verification. Today basic PCRs are performed in benchtop machines called thermocycler, which is a quite portable small device. Now the thermocycler can rapidly heat up and cool down on its own to temperatures necessary for the reaction to happen. But in the old days, my professors told me they had to use several big water baths and manually dip the reaction mixture into different water baths to get the temperature right for the reaction. It was quite hectic in those days. The old days were in the early 1980s when Dr. Mullis developed PCL when he was still a PhD student. Now, normally, DNA replication happens at the physiological temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. But there are hot spring microorganisms that survive and thrive at near water boiling temperatures. So it took several years to isolate the special DNA polymerase, tag polymerase, from these microorganisms and use it in PCL. Now it wasn't until 1988 for the industry to introduce the first automated thermocycler. Now in 1990, fluorescent DNA binding dye was used to monitor DNA amplification, so it was called the real-time PCR. A year later, another variant, reverse transcription PCR, was developed to identify RNA viruses. Now, the PCR technology is so widely used and made a profound impact on the scientific community, so Dr. Mullis was awarded Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1993. Now, it's time to bake. Now, whenever I teach my lab students to set up a PCR, I always tell them it is time to bake. Why? Now, because setting up a PCR reaction mixture is not so different than mixing different ingredients for baking. The amount of each component needs to be precise, and sometimes the order of putting each into the reaction also matters. Now, after everything is mixed well, baking happens in an oven and PCL happens in the thermocycler. They both require a high temperature to complete the drop. Now, so the basic components in a PCL mixture are first the DNA sample for amplification, 
Next is the building blocks or the nucleotides or the DNTPs. Third is the enzyme for the reaction, tag polymerase or other DNA polymerases. But DNA polymerase cannot start the DNA replication reaction from anywhere or from nowhere. It needs a starting point. So primers are needed to provide the initial starting location for replication. And lastly, any enzymes need a buffer condition to work best. And DNA polymerase in particular works best in an optimal concentration of magnesium ion. Now when everything is mixed well in a PCR tube, it is time for action. The basic PCR reaction is composed of three different phases dedicated with three sets of temperatures. Now the first step is called denaturation. It uses temperatures from 92 to 95 degrees Celsius to melt apart the two strands of the DNA template. Notice that DNA denaturation is a reversible process. And as soon as the temperature drops down below the melting temperature of the two strands, they will spontaneously come back together and reestablish the double helixes structure. And after the denaturing process, the thermocyclos turn down the temperature a little bit to about 50 to 60 degrees Celsius for the two short pieces of primer to a new to each strand. Now these primers are custom designed to have about 20 bases that match each of the forward and reverse strands of the DNA template. Now then the thermocycle increases the temperature back to about 70 degrees, which is the optimum temperature for the DNA polymerase to replicate the DNA. After these three steps, it has completed one cycle of PCR. Now each cycle doubles the amount of DNA, so the DNA replication process in the thermocycle grows in an exponential rate. The figure on the right here showed that after four cycles of reaction, it ends up with 16 copies of the original DNA template. Normally, most enzymatic reactions are optimum at about 37 degrees Celsius, but the DNA polymerase from the uh, thermophilic bacteria, Thermus aquaticus, is special that it can function at a much higher temperature. Tech polymerase is stable at near water boiling temperature. This has allowed the enzyme to survive the DNA denaturing temperature and replicate the DNA afterward in the thermocycle. It is also this special high temperature stability property that allows the enzyme to be isolated very easily from other proteins because all you need to do is to heat up a protein mixture to near boiling. Or other proteins will denature and precipitate in the solution, but the tag polymerase will remain in the solution. A simple quick centrifugation can remove the precipitation of the non-related proteins. The my lab also do the same process to isolate the tag polymerase reproduced in-house. Beyond checking the plasmid, PCR has also found a place in other applications. One of the most common uses of PCR is to use it as a molecular diagnostic tool to detect and amplify a low amount of specific DNA sequence that is unique to an organism. Now, although it is not a direct culture method, it is still relatively fast and mostly reliable certainly assuming there is no human error in sample collection process. Another use for it is to genotype certain cancer types that may or may not contain a specific receptor that can be used as a therapeutic target for some drugs. Let's use influenza A as our example. Its diagnosis can be confirmed with reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCL. This is a variation of the original PCL, which first performs a reverse transcription reaction to turn influenza viral RNA collected from respiratory specimens into cDNA, 
and that cDNA will then be amplified. The method is highly sensitive and specific to identify the differences between influenza A, B, and other subtypes. The whole process can be done within a few hours or less. Here are the graphical illustrations to tell the basic differences between PCR and reverse transcription PCR. In RT-PCR, the RNA template is first reverse transcribed into a copy DNA or cDNA. Then that cDNA serves as the template of subsequent DNA polymerase reaction. Notice that the reverse transcription step does require a separate enzyme reverse transcriptase to complete that step. There are two ways to set up an RT-PCR reaction. In the one-step setup, the messenger RNA, primers, reverse transcriptase, DNA polymerase, buffer, and DNTPs are all in one PCR tube, and everything competed at once. In a second two-step reaction, Reverse transcription is first performed, and the cDNA is isolated for the following PCR reaction. Another variation of PCR is called real-time PCR. This is usually coupled with reverse transcription PCR. Now, real-time PCR contains a fluorescent dye that can continuously track the DNA amplification process and the amount of PCR product at the end of each cycle. In contrast, the typical PCR is performed at a predetermined cycle number. This is called endpoint PCR. And the PCR product is checked at the end of all cycles with DNA gel electrophoresis and quantified with densitometry or quantitative measurements after DNA extraction from the PCR product. Here is the schematic illustration to show the differences between real-time and endpoint PCR. Now, typically, real-time PCR is much more sensitive and is particularly useful when overestimating the PCR cycle is undesired in a molecular diagnostic test. Now, in order to track the DNA amplification process, Real-time PCR uses special fluorescent dyes that only generate a fluorescent signal when they interact with the double-stranded DNA and not the single-stranded non-amplified DNA. Now, so the stronger the signal indicates, the more DNA is present in the reaction tube, and the whole reaction can be stopped when there is a detectable signal for the intended purposes of the reaction, such as diagnosis of a disease. Overall, PCR has its advantage such as high sensitivity, relatively easy to set up, and fast turnaround time. But the reaction is prone to contamination and operator errors. Now, when I start a student in my lab, it usually takes at least two to three trials of PCR practice for the student to get it right. So although it looks easy on paper, hands-on experience may not be as straightforward. But perhaps the biggest disadvantage and most criticized weakness of PCR as a diagnostic tool is that detecting viral or bacterial genomic material in patient samples does not always equate to an active infection. We have seen that quite often. And the reason is that simply having a low number of pathogenic load or pathogenic uh, organism load that is being suppressed by the immune system does not indicate infection. But since the pathogen is there, PCR can detect it. So most of the time, a confirmed diagnosis of an infection requires a positive PCR and the presence of symptoms associated with that disease. I mentioned fluorescent signals in this lecture, and in our next lecture, we will explore how antibodies are used in combination with fluorescent molecules to help with diagnosis. So stay tuned, and see you next time.